we found two correlations. One is a correlation that more massive galaxies contain more massive black holes. And the other is a correlation that galaxies in which the stars are moving faster contain bigger black holes. What the results are telling us, both of these correlations are telling us, are screaming something important at us. They're telling us that there's a very close correlation, a very close connection between the time in the history of the black hole, when the black hole got most of its mass, and the process by which the galaxies form. And we have suspected that there is such a correlation for a long time, but it gets a lot more ironclad when the correlations that we see get as good as they are now. For the past 30 years, many people have been trying to understand quasars. And they've built up a very complicated theoretical picture about what quasars are. And on the other hand, there have been other people who have been trying to understand galaxy formation. And they've picked, built up several pictures, actually, of how galaxies might form. But the quasar and the galaxy formation pictures weren't very closely connected. What our work has helped to do is cement the connection between the quasar and galaxy formation pictures, and in doing so, reduce the number of possibilities about galaxy formation that people are thinking about. One of the missions of the Hubble Space Telescope since the very beginning, I think, was always thought to be the search for supermassive black holes. Because what you need to do is be able to see very close to galaxy centers. And getting outside the atmosphere is central to being able to do that. So this problem has always been on our mind. And similarly, the properties of the cis spectrograph were designed in part to make it possible to do this kind of a search. So both the Hubble Space Telescope and this spectrograph specifically are addressing a lot of problems. But one of the central ones has always been the black hole search. This spectrum shows the outer parts of the galaxy well, and the inner parts are fried. Um, let's do something else first so that I get ready. Um, and the problem is that the surface brightness is varying a lot. The galaxy gets brighter toward the middle. So I can also display this so that you can see the middle. And then you can begin to see that there's a zigzag in the spectral lines. That's the signature of the black hole. But you can't see it very well. So if I take the surface brightness gradient and divide it out, then I get this image. Now the surface brightness doesn't vary anymore because I've taken it out. And all you see is the spectral lines. And if you look at this, you see there's a collection of very narrow lines here and here. They're night sky absorption lines, water in the Earth's atmosphere. These are the lines that belong to the galaxy. And you can see that these lines have a very big zigzag in them. And that's the Doppler shift, the color at which the atoms in the star surfaces are absorbing light, which is that color, that color, and that color, but not these. That color is being shifted because the stars are moving. So on one side, it's shifted toward the red. On the other side, it's shifted toward the blue. That's because as you look at this galaxy, this side is spinning away from you, and the other side is spinning towards you. So on one side, the light's blue shifted, that. 
and on the other side of the center, the light's red shifted, like that. And that's the signature of the black hole. Near the black hole, the stars have to move very fast because there's all this extra mass pulling. And then I can take this spectrum and run it through a reduction program that calculates velocities, right? Because all here, here you see qualitatively what's going on. But if I run it through the program that calculates velocities, quantitative data, this shows a quantitative version of this. Brightness is a function of color, so it's a cut through this. And this is a cut down at large radii. And these three spectral lines are these three spectral lines. And you can see they're not as narrow as the night sky lines, but fairly narrow. That's because the stars aren't moving very fast here. This is a standard star. So this is one single star. And you can see how much narrower the lines are. The fact that the lines were broad in the other one means the stars are moving a little bit. Drum. This is how the rotation velocity depends on position. So rotation here, rotation here, rotation here. And then as you get into the zigzag, there's the big zigzag in rotation velocity. And I can expand this up so you see it better. This is just the very center. You can see how very fast the center is spinning. On one side, the stars are going away from us at 150 kilometers per second. On the other side, the stars are coming toward us at 150 kilometers per second because the center is spinning. And at the very center, of course, the stars aren't rotating. And if you look... You got a good shot of that, Clary. Right. It just...